the village stood on the edge of a dense forest. Near I, a road passed by with cars and intercity buses speeding along. Next to the road was a bus stop, a store, and a small market where locals sold everything they could grow in their gardens or gather in the forest. Mushrooms, berries, nuts, and vegetables. Beside the road stood a well that once had water, but unexpectedly dried up. The locals covered it with a lid and avoided it, attributing the incident to some enchantment cast upon the village. All of this happened when a strange old man appeared in the village, who later turned out to be a werewolf. No one knew where he came from. Early in the morning, he would emerge from the forest carrying two baskets in his hands and head to the market. After selling nuts, mushrooms, or berries at a modest price, he would return. Occasionally, he would visit the store to buy only matches and salt. Some tried to follow him, but it was futile. The old man seemed to evaporate. However, a few times, he boarded a bus and went somewhere. Around the same time the old man appeared in the village, wolves started appearing in the forest. No one saw the animals themselves, but traces were constantly found. Their loud howling instilled fear and terror, causing the village to seemingly wither. Everyone was afraid to go out, especially in the evenings. They organized several hunts, but the wolves seemed to sense it and disappeared somewhere. The market had grown accustomed to the strange old man. Occasionally, a young man, strikingly similar to the old man, would come instead. He introduced himself as the old man's grandson, arriving in an old, beaten-up car to sell forest treasures. After quickly selling his goods, he would leave. On one of those days, the young man was about to leave, but he stepped into the store. Next to him, a man was selling apples from his orchard. He noticed a forgotten pack of cigarettes and a lighter on the ground. Picked them up, scanning the area for the old man's grandson. Through the store window, he saw the cigarette owner. The trader rushed into the store and encountered the old man. Besides him and the saleswoman, no one else was there. Where is your grandson? He asked. Grandson, he was just here. Take these. The man handed over the pack of cigarettes and the lighter. He forgot them. Oh, thank you. I'll make sure he gets them. The man hurried back. He saw the grandson leaving the store, taking a cigarette, lighting it, sitting in the car and driving away. The man was ready to swear that the boy wasn't in the store. But the old man never came out again. The man decided not to tell anyone about this incident. During the night, the entire village heard gunshots from the house closest to the forest. The homeowner explained that he had been attempting to shoot a wolf. Everyone observed blood on the ground near the barn. Near the barn, initially, the dog picked up the trail but then it whimpered and stayed in place. Everyone fell into a surprised silence. The old man didn't show up at the market for several days. Then he was seen heading to the bus stop. It was noticeable that he limped heavily on his right leg. Surprisingly, with the departure of the old man, all the peculiarities ceased. The wolves disappeared, or was it just one wolf and the fears vanished? water returned to the well. After some time, a small hut was found in the forest. In the room, there were a mattress and several rags with dried blood on the floor. The table had matches and salt. There was nothing else in the house. In the house in the house, a rumor spread through the village that someone had supposedly seen the old man's grandson passing by on the road. However, no one saw the old man himself, neither at the market nor in the neighboring village. The conclusion suggested itself. The old man was a werewolf.
the bear maiden. The concept of a bear maiden might seem like a fantasy to some. However, the author of this story, despite being a fan of the mystical, never believed in werewolves, due to his profession, a square figure. The chief editor appeared at the editorial office entrance. Oh, Orlov, come in. I caught the alarmed looks from my colleagues. Everyone knew that when the boss addressed you by your last name and used the formal you, trouble was imminent, but I couldn't care less. Everything was indifferent to me now. Sit down, Yuri Yefimovich gestured to the chair opposite his imposing desk. The chief editor disdainfully pushed towards me. Sheets of paper fastened with a staple. What is this? I looked at the title. Um, an article. Mine. Yeah. This is rubbish. Not an article. Orloff, murky pedantry and endless dullness. Plus, half of it is ripped off from the internet. Publishing this would only destroy the magazine completely. And tomorrow's issue is going to press. And it will have four empty pages instead of your... Pardon my language article. Yura paused. He drank tea from a large cup on the table. Slurping loudly. You should cut down on tea with six spoonfuls of sugar. I wanted to tell my former comrade, now, the boss, and hit the gym to shed those extra pounds. But I remained silent. Yura Yefimovich was right. My article was plagiarized from the internet, and in essence, utter nonsense. But I was no longer capable of anything else. Quit, or let Stokeman fire me. I'll give the boss sadistic pleasure. Are you drinking? Yura asked quietly. No, I honestly lied. He was unaware that I started having a drink at lunch, and by evening, I could hardly find my way to the trolley bus. With three transfers, I crawled across the entire city back home. I can't drive anymore, and the metro won't allow me. But in my current state, I won't survive another night. In the night awaits a wet highway. The speeding lights of a truck, screeching brakes, the ringing cry of pain. What does it matter that I'm not at fault? That the truck driver who fell asleep at the wheel is to blame for everything? He too will listen for the rest of his days to the screeching and the cry of the woman who his truck smeared on the road, the cry of my Lenochka. And yet, I could have refused to go out that night, but my beloved wanted so much to watch the sunrise over the sea. Nikita, you can't go on like this. Almost a year has passed, and you still can't pull yourself together. My boss and friend spoke quietly. You can't bring Lena back, but you need to live. I know you visit the cemetery every other day. Why? Why? What? Why? Why? Why do I need to live? Yura sighed loudly. It's up to God to decide how much time each person has. Since you survived, there must be something left for you to do on this earth. You know what? Go on a trip. I've already been on vacation. Twice, in case you're not aware. I'm aware. Go on a business trip. We need something. Mystical Mysterious for the October issue. Portals, time travel. Wizards. But it has to be all real. Understand. Not fantasies from the internet. Given your inclination toward the afterlife. It's a task for you. And where do I find a time portal? On the Moscow? St. Petersburg Highway. I'll stop to have a drink three minutes before Lenochka's death, and the truck will pass by. The boss slammed his hand on the table. No. I received a letter from my aunt in Upper Lesia. It's a village in the Carpathian Mountains of Ukraine. She's asking for help, 
needs assistance with her household. And what's that got to do with me? This pointless conversation, from my point of view, was starting to wear me out. I wanted to look into the bottom drawer of the desk where a bottle of brandy awaited. I'm asking you as a friend to go to her. I can't do it right now. And you can take a break at the same time. Well, if it helps me take a break. Understand, her husband died a couple of years ago. The kids have scattered. They do send her money regularly, but they don't rush to delight the old mother with their presence. Aunt Gala clearly needs help and she's lonely there. I would gladly go with Natasha, but my princess only acknowledges foreign lands. Fine, I'll go. My Lenochka won't object from the other side. The chief editor snorted. He finished his cold tea. I stood up, took a step towards the door. They have a belief. There, Yura's voice reached me, that a tribe of bear, werewolves, lives in the forest. It's like brown bears have been mating with humans since ancient times, giving birth to children. That's how bear, human werewolves came into existence. They are allotted an equal share of life in the form of a beast, and the form of a beast and a human. What do you think of the legend? I don't know why these words of the boss pierce through the veil of my despair. They reached my brain. To that part of it that once generated ideas and wrote captivating stories. According to everyone who read them, I returned to the table. Investigate. Sniff around. Yura continued. Look for these Ukrainian. Origin werewolves. Well, if you don't want to, I'll send Kostya Petrov. He can't write at all. Mind you, but his uncle is one of the shareholders of our publishing house. Damn him. A publishing house. I even managed a hint of irony. Incredible. Uncle Petrov and his nephew together. Kostya has long been eager to get the first four pages. I'm still resisting. But the arguments are running out. Yura vividly ran his plump hand over his own throat. Yes. Kostya was quite the werewolf. I'll go. I'll do everything. Well done, Orlov. I didn't make a mistake in you, Yuri Efimovich. Beamed. And, uh, try not to drink. At least while you're living with Aunt Gala. My uncle succumbed to cheap moonshine. He was a real man, but not a fool. Got hooked on the cheap stuff. I didn't respond to that. Why make promises that are bound to be unfulfilled? Despite being a fan of all things mystical, I approached the editorial task with great irony and skepticism. Werewolves in the 21st century, in Central Europe. It's laughable, but Yura will get his werewolf stories. My imagination is as wild as Prosper Merimay's, who described these. It took me three days to reach my destination. Just a little more. To walk to the village where Aunt Galena lived, I stood in the square, surrounded by quite old buildings, either former shops or workshops, scratching my head. When next, Yura assured me he had arranged everything. In this village, where no transportation goes to Verkolesia anymore, someone would meet me. Unfortunately, the square was deserted, resembling a lunar landscape, a cold wind rustled fallen maple leaves across it, and fuzzy cloud patches drifted across the low sky. I pulled out my mobile, contemplating whether to curse Yura for his arrangements, or attempt to call Aunt Galena with the stupid question, Auntie, where are you? Yura had provided me with his number, cautioning about the unstable signal in these parts. There was no signal at all. The mobile displayed a crossed-out eye, indicating no connection. Muttering some curses under my breath, I pulled out a map from my backpack. Smart, not to rely on those Google navigators, and a small bottle. After three sips, the world seemed less hostile. The map, 
assured me that Verkal Hesha was practically within arm's reach on a decent road. Well then, a couple more sips, and off I go. The dirt road slowly ascended. I walked for a long time, occasionally illuminating the map with my mobile. Then, my mobile got offended and refused to turn on. Night surrounded me, somewhere above. Fir trees danced in a circle of prickly stars. It became cold. I increasingly leaned on the cherished bottle. But the intoxication was overpowered by the cold, dispelling the pleasure like an exorcist banishing a demon from me. Suddenly, the road, which, according to the map, should lead to the village, ended. Trees and underbrush stood in a wall in front of me. What the hell? A narrow path plunged into a bowl. I pondered for not too long, about three seconds, and dived after it. Behind the bushes, a clearing opened up, and on it stood a wooden house. Light shone through the windows, and smoke curled above the chimney. Right now, Baba Yaga would probably fly out of the stove. However, instead of an old woman with a broom in the doorway, which swung wide open as if on cue, appeared a tall, unmistakably female silhouette. Mm. Hostess. Let me stay for the night, I said plaintively. I got lost on the road. I'm not dangerous. A journalist by profession. I couldn't see her face against the light, but I noticed that the hostess was a huge, young brown bear. My legs immediately turned into jelly. Run. She'll catch up. Fight. A swipe of her clawed paw would finish me off. And no one will ever know. An unpleasant voice echoed in my head. Why are you standing there? Come in. You'll cool down the house. The she... Bear growled, disappearing into the depths of the dwelling. Limping. I followed. So... This is a shapeshifter. In the 21st century, we live only once in the large, bright room. I glanced at the hostess and couldn't help but exclaim, oh, What the hell is this? It turned out the she. There was a girl, dressed in a long, fur-lined vest. On her head, a fashionable hat with ears, which the beauty promptly removed. Beautiful chestnut hair cascaded down her shoulders. Why are you swearing? The hostess grumbled. Drunk or something. And what a smell from you. Mm. No, I did have a drink. But the cognac is high. Quality. It's cold, after all. Just two sips. Want some? I don't drink. There's a basin and a jug. Wash up. We'll have dinner. I looked at the table, dumplings, probably with berries, honey, bread, and sour cream in a bowl. My stomach rumbled. I hurried to wash up. The girl took off her fur coat, revealing an amazing figure. Slim, a full chest and a slender waist. Long arms with large but graceful palms. I felt that my body responded to this beauty as it hadn't in many months since the accident. Apparently, the girl understood this as she smirked. Mm. Eat. It'll cool down. What's your name? Mm. Nikita. Married? Married? My wife died in an accident. I uttered these words for the first time. Surprisingly, I felt relief. My condolences. May she rest in peace. You're not to blame. I still blame myself. Blamed. Hmm. Ursula. Not a common name. Where's it from? She didn't answer. Got up from the table, took me by the hand and led me to a wide couch by the stove. I didn't resist. It was a crazy night. Not just because for the first time since my wife's death, 
I was with a woman. Ursula herself was something out of a fairy tale. I had never experienced such sensations, and I probably never would. Finally, tired, I fell asleep. I was awakened by voices. I cautiously peered out from behind the stove and was astonished. The hostess was sitting at the table completely naked, and across from her, two bears were devouring dumplings. What do we do with him now? Asked one. His speech was quite clear, according to our laws. Let him, let him go in the morning. He's a city dweller. He'll think he imagined it. Such things are unbelievable. And what will he tell? That he was sheltered for the night by a she, beer, and it's time for me to give birth. The womb is ready. He has plenty of seed. Go, brothers. I feel everything will be fine. Ursula got up, stretched, caressed her belly, and chuckled. Ah, oh, my friend, such a sweet one. Foresaw him for me. The larger bear grumbled. Oh, your friend. You shouldn't associate with humans. Terrified, I dove under the blanket. I woke up when the sun was high. The house was empty. On the table were a jug of milk, a pot of honey and bread, and a note. Go left on the path. You'll reach the road. Thank you, Nikita. Be happy. A local guy gave me a ride to Aunt Galena's. She lamented. Why didn't I wait for Grandpa Spiridon, who went after me? But she didn't look me in the eyes while saying it. And you are the friend of my unexpected lover. The she. Beer girl. I understood. How Grandpa acquired the gift of the werewolf and passed it on to me. In this story, I want to recount how I received the gift of the werewolf. Did anyone ask me if I needed such a gift? especially in our challenging times. No, but fate had different plans. The flickering flames danced their simple dance on the dark curtains that almost tightly covered the windows, which no one had tried to open for a long time. The fire in the fireplace would dim and then flare up again with renewed vigor trying to conquer the gray semi-darkness that had enveloped the walls of the building since evening. Everything here seemed to be preparing for the mystery of the owner's transition into some new unknown state. It happens sometimes when a person is overtaken by illusion, and then the instigator of the imaginary triumph who turned 90 today feels like he has achieved a tangible success in his eternal and hopeless battle against time. The owner of this building flatly refused to celebrate his 90th birthday, stating that he did not want to see anyone on this day except for one grandson. I loved my grandfather, but I didn't see him often. In my 16 years, this was the seventh or eighth meeting when we went on vacation with my parents to visit him. Grandpa was a knowledgeable and versatile person. It was evident in his proud posture, well, spoken language with clear diction and the ability to emphasize the right words. In his monologue for better perception, he could either raise his voice or reduce it to a whisper turning his speech into a theatrical performance. During each of our visits, he always found time to tell me a new story, perhaps even from his own life. Now, sitting by the fireplace for half an hour after dinner, Grandpa began his tale. And, as always, I sharpened my ears, set aside the book, and prepared
prepared to hear his next intriguing story. What you'll hear from me today, I haven't even told your father. Today, I'll share with you a story that is a part of my personal life. A very important part. Listen. It happened in 1918. It was a dreadful and unforgettable time. Houses and entire villages were ablaze. The very land was on fire, ignited by the conflicting hearts of those so close, yet sometimes so different, whether white or red. At that time, I had just turned five, and my parents and I found ourselves in the midst of the Civil War. We lived in the village of Zulanika, located in the Mariinsk Volost of the Barnul district. By the summer of 18, the Kolchak forces had already taken control. For a while, a detachment led by Lieutenant Romanovsky was stationed in our village. My father knew him slightly, so he welcomed him to stay for a few days. However, soon, near the village of Sorokino, Romanovsky's entire detachment was defeated by partisans, led by the anarchist Rogov who struggled on the side of the Reds. As soon as Rogoff's men occupied our Zulanika, the locals immediately betrayed my parents, accusing them of sheltering white guards. My mother and father were shot without trial or investigation on the same day. That evening, I ran into the woods. Throughout the night, I wandered through the forest, trying to reach the village of Zavialika, where my father's relatives lived. Lost in the woods, tired and hungry, I eventually fell asleep. Burying myself in the first haystack, I came across. There, under the morning light, I was found by the local healer, rumored to be a sorcerer named Artaman. Spotting me in the haystack, he approached and asked, Whose kid are you? Where did you come from? And how did you end up here? Seeing a big bearded man arriving on a cart, I was initially frightened and burst into tears. The man gently patted my head and asked, or rather inquired, Do you have parents? They were there. I cried louder. They were killed. He took my hand and quietly said, Come with me. We'll figure out a way to live together. That's how my life with Artemon began. He noticed something about me right away when he saw me and asked, Do you want to become a sorcerer? Like you. Something along those lines. Is that good or bad? If you help people, it's good. If you harm them, it's bad. I sighed again and said, All right then. He taught me everything he knew, and he knew a lot. It sometimes seemed to me that there was nothing he didn't know or couldn't do. Like a sponge, I absorbed all the wisdom of sorcery from him. Studied herbs, their properties, and methods of application. He taught me prayers, spells for various ailments, and other mystical knowledge. By the age of ten, I could remove curses, cast spells to alleviate illnesses, and relieve pain with just a simple touch. People came to Artemon almost every day seeking help and he never turned anyone away. They paid him with food. He never accepted money. Gradually, he began entrusting me with some of his healing duties, and I slowly became involved in the art of healing. Once or twice a month, 
Ottoman would leave the house for the entire night. When I asked where, he always replied, I must go to commune with nature to comprehend its secrets and mysteries. Lie down and sleep peacefully. No one will harm you here. I'll be back by morning. He would return at dawn and our usual day of work together would begin. He taught me to read, write and count. He had books, including fiction, which I enjoyed reading in my free time and would often reread several times. Soon, I became curious about his past, but he never shared much on that topic. He casually mentioned that his parents, wealthy and educated, were exiled here by royal decree and had long since passed away. Why do you live alone? I asked him repeatedly. At first, he gave evasive answers, but later he explained more clearly. I understood that it was related to his abilities and his healing practices. Solitude is the fate of the strong. The weak always cling to the crowd, he always repeated. But the world is vast, interesting, and beautiful. You yourself taught me that, I would tell him. You'll understand later, he would grimly respond. That's how we lived together until I turned 16. And so, one night, he, as usual, was preparing to go into the woods, but then he reconsidered, stopped and asked me, We've lived together for 11 years. In that time, you've learned a lot from me and realized that most of the knowledge and skills didn't come to you just like that. You were able to embrace it, not only thanks to me, your teacher, but also because of your innate abilities, the ability to ease pain, induce sleep, hear thoughts, and so on. These things aren't learned easily. And you've known about it for a long time. When I first saw you, I knew right away that you would succeed. But there's one more ability we share. One that ordinary people don't possess. What else can you do that I don't know about? I asked him. Yesterday, you turned 16 and I can reveal to you the mystery of transformations. If you wish, you can master this art. Do you want me to show you its full beauty? Yes, I replied. Show me. That was the only thing I hadn't learned from him at that time. All right. Watch, but don't be afraid. After a while, it became completely dark. A massive moon emerged from behind the clouds and illuminated the yard outside the window. The road leading to the river and the village, the edge of the forest, and even the chain of hills that were barely visible during the day. Artemon barely managed to open the door to the street when he fell onto his back and started rolling on the floor. With horror, I noticed how his strong and beautiful hands became thinner and shortened. The fingers of his hands spread apart, making way for claws. His back and chest decreased in size and rounded. Thick gray fur quickly emerged from all over his body. Within two minutes, I saw before me a large werewolf which was even somewhat beautiful. The werewolf roared, and in that roar I heard, We'll talk tomorrow. Go to sleep. He jumped out through the open door and dissolved into the night. I didn't sleep well that night, and I dreamed of werewolves, a whole pack of them, 
as if I were running with them. A young, strong wolf on the hunt, tearing warm meat with his teeth. In the morning, Ottoman brought me out of oblivion. He patted my head again and said, Well, did you like what you saw? And I replied, yes. We'll explore transformations then, he asked. We will, I said. For this, there exists an ancient werewolf ritual. He then described all its details to me. Remember everything well. It might come in handy for you one day. We'll perform the ritual in the second half of the full moonlit night. At the edge of the forest, we'll need to light a bonfire. For the werewolf ritual, you need a wolf ritual. You need a wolf, but it will. You need a wolf, but a wolf cub will do. It must bite you. I'll brew a special infusion from herbs and honey and place it in the ice cellar, keeping it there until the ritual. We'll start the ritual as soon as the moon's disk reaches its uppermost point. Undress down to your waist. Stand with your back to the fire. Drink a cup of the infusion and say specific words. Will I be a werewolf for the rest of my life? I asked. Yes, if you wish. Within a year after the ritual, you can undergo a purification ceremony. This is because only a newly born werewolf cannot change their essence. I'll tell you about the reverse ritual afterward. But remember, if you perform this ritual, one of your descendants will inherit the gift of the werewolf, whether they want it or not. And they, in turn, have exactly one year from their 16th birthday to the first full moon to willingly rid themselves of this gift through a purification ritual. One night of the ritual, Ottoman brought a wolf cub in his teeth, which snarled ferociously and tried to bite its tormentor. Naturally, as soon as I offered my hand to him, he bit me with all his might and immediately dashed away into the woods with a victorious growl. From that day on, two werewolves roamed the surroundings during the night outings. It was a wonderful sensation of strength, agility and speed as we raced, chasing a hapless rabbit or a trembling deer. The taste of warm blood. The sound of crunching bones. All of this thrilled me. A young werewolf, until we unexpectedly stumbled upon hunters. There was a wolf hunt organized in the village, and we were unaware of it. Artaman saved me that time, shielding me with his body from the bullet as the marksman aimed at the beast with his rifle. I won't disclose what I did to that marksman. The next morning I sat at the table, put my head in my hands, and cried for a long time. In eleven years, I not only got used to Artaman, but also came to love this remarkable man in my own way. Over time, I realized that the saying about solitude wasn't for me, and that I need to live among people. Most importantly, I had to go without the werewolf gift. In the upcoming full moon, I successfully underwent the purification ritual. From then on, it was the life of an ordinary human. Evening school in Gorno, Altesk, then a teacher's institute in Barnaul. After that, there was the war. Conscription in July 1941, 
numerous injuries, two bravery medals, the Order of Glory, other medals, the Order of Glory, other me But you've seen and know about all that. I've lived an interesting life and never regretted the past. Five years ago, we buried your grandmother. We met just a year before the war. She was a wonderful, faithful companion to me for almost 58 years. Your father was born in 1946, and today I invited you to my 90th birthday alone to specifically tell you about the werewolf gift, which has been in you for 16 years, waiting for the first full moon. And I also want to talk about, stunned by all this, unexpected information that had suddenly come crashing down on me. I didn't notice or didn't hear as my grandpa suddenly gasped for breath. His left hand reached for his heart while his right one fumbled in the pocket of his robe in search of pills. I only realized all of this when grandpa stopped gasping and his lifeless hand hung down. Grandpa's head leaned on his shoulder his back slumped against the chair's backrest. Only then did I understand that my beloved grandpa was no more. He left without saying goodbye. But most importantly, he didn't get to say what he called me for. Alone, I shook him for a long time, screamed, scolded grandpa then cried, begged, and pleaded with him to reveal the purification ritual to rid me of the dreadful gift. But Grandpa remained silent. The large room with sealed windows felt suffocating. I approached the nearest window, pulled back the curtains, and flung it open wide. The fresh coolness of the July night flowed through the window it became a bit easier to breathe. But then I noticed how a huge moon emerged from behind the clouds. A terrifying force threw me to the floor. The world spun before my eyes. I rolled on the floor, afraid to see how my body changed, how huge claws emerged. Teeth altered and thick gray fur sprouted from everywhere. After a few minutes, I felt immense lightness throughout my body, the strength of fangs, the power of claws, and a vast array of scents that teased and lured me into the forest, emitting a triumphant roar. I leapt out of the window and raced into the woods with frenzied bounds, embracing the new reality that awaited me. The white wolf, a cunning and intelligent werewolf with sharp fangs and burning red eyes, stealthily prowled through the night instilling fear in the residents and hunters alike who found themselves in the remote corners of the Tambov land. Every winter, I go to the forests near Tambov to hunt wolves. These bloodthirsty creatures have been increasingly troubling the locals lately. Like many other hunters, I am paid by the local authorities for every wolf I manage to shoot. Such a trip took place again this year. On a regular weekday, my dog Darcy and I got off the bus on a forest road. We immediately ventured into the impassable wilderness. By evening, I had set up a campfire, had a meal from the supplies I brought, threw some wood into the fire, and went to sleep. I slept for about three hours. No more. Something made me open my eyes. The campfire was already dying down. Darcy sat next to me, growling. I had never seen him like this before. His fur bristled menacingly, eyes and fangs gleaming in the darkness. He was staring in the night thicket. 
What's there, Darcy? I ask, raising my hunting rifle. A pack of wolves could easily be nearby, and encountering them at night promised nothing good. However, nothing disturbed the silence, and I slightly calmed down. Perhaps some animal had passed nearby, and the dog sensed it. Well, well, Darcy. Calm down. I patted the dog on the back. It probably just seemed to you. And suddenly, a sharp whistle broke the silence. It was so unexpected that I almost screamed. The whistle was clearly human. Almost immediately after the whistle, a wolf's howl followed. Another and another. And finally, dozens of similar voices shattered the remaining silence. Darcy broke loose as if from a leash, and I could barely restrain him. A minute later, the howling subsided, and nothing disturbed the silence anymore, except for the frightened flapping of the wings of sleepy birds. I heard the whistle very close, and when I regained my composure a bit, I decided to go in the direction from which it came. Perhaps someone needed my help. Tossing some wood into the fire so as not to get lost, I took the rifle over my shoulder and cautiously began to make my way through the dense trees. I didn't have to walk for long. Literally, a hundred steps away, there was a large clearing where some strange shadows were darting about. It was a full moon, and upon closer inspection, I realized that they were wolves. Darcy was no longer growling. He whimpered and trembled, pressing against my leg. I quietly sat down on the ground. There were many wolves. I even lost count. They kept running in circles around something that I couldn't make out. It looked like a large stone. But what was even more terrifying, it emitted sounds that could not be mistaken for anything other than human speech. Suddenly, the stone seemed to split open, revealing a human figure before me. He was old and gray, with a large gray cloak draped over his shoulders, creating the illusion of a stone. The old man spread his arms, lifted his hoary head towards the sky, and began singing a wild, beastly song. It seemed as though he was praying to the moon. Fear gripped me. The wolves didn't touch him. They halted their ritualistic run and whimpering like puppies, quietly approached his feet. Ignoring them, the old man continued his primal song. Suddenly, he sat down. The wolves momentarily enveloped him with their bodies, and just like that, the old man was gone, replaced by a massive white wolf, a werewolf. The wolf circled the clearing, then dashed away, followed by the entire pack. Was it a dream, a delusion, or a mirage? I called out to Darcy, but he didn't respond. No matter how much I whistled for him later, he never appeared. I reached the campfire, gathered my modest belongings, and left that strange forest with the first rays of the sun. Later. I realized I had received a warning. That's why they didn't harm me. The werewolf conveyed to me who was in charge here, and I had to convey this to people. But I told no one. No one would believe me. Eventually, I learned that since that time, the wolves in the area became unbearable, extending their attacks beyond domestic animals. Hunts were organized against them, but some supernatural instinct allowed the wolves to elude capture. They always knew where the hunters awaited them. Rumor had it that a large white wolf was their leader. <laughs>